for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as Johnny Dollar. Dave Brace, Johnny. Plymouth Mutual. Oh, hiya, Dave. Uh, Johnny, uh, sapphires are bad luck. Yeah, so are black cats. Cats don't get stolen, though. Or at least we don't insure them. How much? 30000 Does the name Benny Stark mean anything to you? Benny Stark. Yeah, jewel thief. Couple of convictions. I haven't heard of him lately. Well, you're hearing now. He called us from Rockport, outside of Chicago. Wants to talk a deal. He apparently has the sapphire necklace. Who's your client, Dave? A girl named Ellen Beauregard. Big wheel in Rockport society. I've already made your plane and hotel reservations and gave Benny your name. <laughs> Right here, I have a few words to say, and I'll say them as quickly as possible. You know, someone once said that everyone and everything in America depends on speed, and that as our country grows older, we all move faster. But it wasn't much more than a hundred years ago that the fastest anyone could travel was at the speed of a running horse, which wasn't very fast when you compare it to the speed of our latest jet plane and talk about going to the moon at 25,000 miles an hour. And during that same 100 years or so, we've grown from the first crude telegraph to the perfection of color television. Yes, this increased speed in transportation, communication, and everything else has changed almost everything in our country, including the cabinet of the United States. For example, up to World War II, there wasn't any reason why the War and Navy Department shouldn't be directly responsible to the president. But then, there was a growing need for the speeding up of military action and decision, calling for unified commands and a more closely knit integration of military activities. Thus, our Department of Defense was born, creating a new cabinet post to coordinate and execute the overall general policies relating to the armed forces. And the secretary heading this new Department of Defense became the representative to the president for the newly designated secretaries of the Army, Navy, and more recently, the Air Force. In the future, our fast-moving world may add even more members to the president's cabinet to ensure the safety and well-being of our United States. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Plymouth Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Beauregard matter. Expense account item one, $58.40. Airfare and incidentals to Rockport, Illinois. I checked into the Bleecker Hotel and waited for a contact from one Benny Stark, jewel thief. I planned to see the Beauregards later, but instead the Beauregards came to see me. Or anyway, one of them did. I'm Jared Beauregard, Mr. Dallara. It was my niece, Ellen, from whom the necklace was stolen. <laughs> May I... Uh... Oh, sure. Come in, Mr. Beauregard. Have a seat. Thank you, sir. Well, this is a little unexpected. I just got in town. Well, uh, Mr. Brace of the insurance company wired us you were coming. I, I wanted to talk to you before you saw Ellen. Oh, I see. My niece is a, a remarkable girl, Mr. Dollar. A trifle headstrong at times, though, and not always inclined to use the best judgment. Well, I guess that could apply to most of us. Uh, yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, now, tell me, Mr. Dollar, do you have any hope that the necklace may be recovered? I think so. It's uh, fairly certain, in fact. Well, uh, Ellen will be uh, very happy. It was an engagement gift, you understand, from Phil Avery, her fiancé. She was quite broken up when it was stolen. Yes, I imagine. $30,000 is quite a loss. Well, it's more the sentiment attached than the uh, beauty of it. You've uh, seen the necklace, Mr. Dollar? No, but I have photographs of it. Oh, yes, from the insurance company. Uh, 
Well, uh, how about your niece, Mr. Borgard? Uh, just what was it you wanted to tell me? <laughs> well, uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Penny, Mr. Dollar. Oh, okay, shoot. You know where the pink pigeon is? No, but I'll find it. Well, it's south of town. I'll meet you there at 9 o'clock tonight. Back pool's behind the bar. Make it? Yeah, sure. Have you um, got the item? I got more than that. I got information that'll blow the lid off. I've been double-crossed, Dollar, and I'm going to get even. What do you mean, double-crossed? Uh-huh. First, we make a deal. See you tonight. I've uh, got to run along, Mr. Dollar. I, I didn't really have anything in particular, just that, uh, well, Ellen is too impulsive sometimes, but she never means any harm by it. I, I'm sure you understand. Expense account item two, $14 to hire a car. Benny was on ice until 9 o'clock, so I decided to call on Ellen Beauregard, the girl who was too headstrong and impulsive but uh, didn't mean any harm by it. Uncle Jarrett was wrong, though. I didn't understand. I left the car near the Beauregard coach house and walked down the terrace toward the entrance. Ahead of me, in a glassed-in sunroom, a man and a girl were so busy with each other that they didn't even notice me. A highly romantic scene. The mistress of the house, probably. The only trouble, though, she was wearing a maid's uniform. She was still a little flushed when she answered the door. Good afternoon, sir. I'd like to see Miss Ellen Beauregard. Uh, my name is Johnny Dollar. Dollar, you're the investigator on the robbery. Dave must have wired everybody in town. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Won't you come in? Thanks. If you'll wait here, please, I'll tell Miss Beauregard you're here. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Bye, Ellen. See you later. Oh, hello. You must be the insurance fellow. You too. <laughs> Ellen said you were due in town today. I'm Phil Avery, Miss Dollar. How do you do? Ellen and I are engaged. I gave her that necklace that was stolen. Yes, I know. I certainly hope you can get it back. The insurance won't cover the sentimental value. Sentimental value? Yes. Oh, I know. I saw you come up on the terrace, but appearances are deceiving sometimes. I wouldn't want you to misunderstand. Oh, I think I understand perfectly, Mr. Avery. Good. Good. Well, I got to run. My officers are in the central bank building. Drop in if there's any information you'd like. Thanks, I will. Bye. I'm awfully sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Dollar. Quite all right, Miss Beauregard. Gave me a chance to meet your fiancé. Oh, isn't Phil a darling? Headstrong sometimes, impulsive, but he... That never means any harm by it, that is. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. Well, I suppose you want to know all about the robbery. No, I think I know most of it already. I would like to see the safe, though. Oh, yes, of course. It's over here behind the painting. You've just got to find that necklace, Mr. Dollar. I feel so guilty about it. Guilty? Why? Well, because it it was a gift from Phil, and not that I was careless, but... <laughs> well, I'm sure you understand. Here it is, back of the portrait. Hmm. An old-fashioned one, huh? Everything in the house is. Our family's been around quite a while. Yes. Wouldn't be much of a job for a professional safe cracker. How'd they get into the house, Miss Beauregard? Force a lock somewhere? No, they must have had a key. You see, I've gone out for the afternoon, and Uncle Jarrett was off somewhere, and the house was empty. Your maid wasn't here? No. No, after I left, she decided to go into town and do some shopping or something. Oh, that they couldn't have picked a better time. No, they couldn't have. Oh, say, incidentally... You'll, uh, you'll probably be talking to Uncle Jarrett, and uh, I wanted to warn you about him. Of course, he means well, but... Is he headstrong and impulsive, too? No. No, it's just that he's, well, a little vague. I'm sure you understand, Mr. Dollar. It was nearly dark when I left filled with understanding and 
with a lot of questions about the Beauregard establishment that still needed answering. I started to open the door of my car when I caught a flash of white at the corner of the coach house. Somebody had seen me and then tried to duck out of sight. I walked across the drive and moved quietly up to the corner. Evening, Lois. Can I help you with that? No. No, I was just going to burn some trash. Well, fine. Let me put it in the incinerator for you. No, please. Oh, it's no trouble. I'll just... Hey, have you sorted through this? There's something heavy inside these papers. Please, let me have it. You won't understand. Well, you're the first one around here who hasn't thought so. Lois! She sounds impatient. You better run along. I'll take care of this for you. No, please, you... Oh! I knew what it was already. And in a moment, I had it unwrapped. A 32 caliber revolver. And one chamber had been fired. Recently. Mr. Dollar? I slipped the gun in my pocket and shoved the papers into the incinerator. Mr. Dollar? Now, right here, Miss Beauregard. Oh. Oh, I saw your car was still in the driveway, and I... Just checking the layout of the ground. I'm leaving now. Oh. Lois just came in from somewhere in this direction. Oh? Was she talking to you by any chance? Oh, we passed the time of day. Well, don't believe anything she tells you. Any uh, definite reason why not? Oh, I've caught her in all sorts of lies. I, I didn't want to say anything inside. She might have been listening. How long has she been with you? Four months. She goes out in the afternoon sometimes, and I know she lies about where she's been. Do you think she had something to do with the robbery? I don't know. I'm only suggesting that you check very carefully on anything she might tell you. Well, if she's like you say, uh, why have you kept her? Well, I've been planning to let her go, but... Well, objections were raised. Who raised the objection? Uncle Jared. <laughs> I got back to the hotel and went to my room. I had another surprise waiting for me. Come right in, son. Have a seat. Oh, thanks. I could be in the wrong room, of course. I'm out of your Mr. Dollar. You know a fellow named Benny Stark? Not exactly. I'm looking forward to meeting him, though. I see. You got business with him? I might. Do I uh, have any with you? My name's Cotton, Mr. Dollar. I'm the chief of police here. Oh. I see. How did you get on to me? Found your name where Stark had written it down. Had your room number here at the hotel. He a friend of yours? Well, I guess we might as well work together, Chief. I'm an insurance investigator. Checking on that Beauregard robbery. Ah, uh, so that's it. Stark is a jewel thief. He phoned the company and offered to talk a deal. I've got an appointment with him at nine tonight. Yeah, I don't reckon you're going to be able to keep it. Why not? Because this Stark fellow got himself shot a few hours ago. Real shot. Dead, in fact. Murdered? Yep. Found him in a room in house over across town. Uh, you wouldn't know anything about it, would you, Mr. Dollar? I might. What kind of a gun was it? 32 revolver, according to the lab. Well, this might be the gun. Hmm. Been fired, all right. Where'd you get it? I took it away from Lois, the Beauregard's maid. He was trying to hide it in the incinerator. You might have it checked, but I doubt if it's registered. It's registered. Huh? We don't have many guns around town here. I recognize this one. Belongs to Jared Beauregard. Uncle Jared, huh? What about these Beauregards? Who are they? What are they? Old line family, four generations. Just the two of them now, Jared and Ellen. Not as wealthy as they once were, maybe. You never know, though. Lately, at least, Jared seems to have plenty of money. Lately? Oh, not just since the robbery, if that's what you think. And I meant the last four or five months. Uh, what about this Phil Avery? Mm, been here a couple of years. Fine young fellow, civic leader. Everybody was pretty tickled when they got engaged last spring. Figured they was meant for each other. Well, he goes in for lavish gifts, at least. Expecting anybody? No. Who is it? Lois. I've got to talk to you, Mr. Dollar. Just a second. You want to dodge into the bathroom and listen in? Good idea. Come in, Lois. Thank you. 
I, I've got to have it back, Mr. Dollar. What? The gun. Oh, please, Mr. Dollar, it's not the way it looks. Somebody's trying to get me in trouble. I found the gun. Where? Hiding under the mattress of my bed. I got scared. I was trying to get rid of it when you stopped me. Tonight in the paper, it says a man's been shot. Did you know him? No. You know whose gun this is? No, I don't know anything about it. Give it to me, please. I'd like to, Lois, but I'm afraid it's not that simple. All right, Chief. You know many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the Presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? As a boy, his general health was bad. But as a man, he was a dynamo of energy. He was only 42 when he became president, the youngest man ever to hold that position. His administration was a fairly untroubled one. There was still no income tax. Other taxes were comparatively low. And the United States was in a peaceful era. Conservation of our natural resources was one of his greatest concerns as president. And in 1902, he signed a bill putting the Reclamation Act into action. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more important clue. During his administration, work was begun on the Panama Canal. Who was he? Theodore Roosevelt, 26th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. <laughs> With our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account item three, two dollars and ninety cents. Two hamburger steak lunches the next day at noon in the Bleecker Hotel Grill. Apparently, a favorite daytime eating place for the president of the Central City Bank. Oh, uh, well, it's too much. I tell you, mind passing me that uh, Tabasco sauce, Mr. Dollar? Oh, here you are. Oh, <laughs> oh I love it on hamburger. <laughs> I love hamburger for that matter. <laughs> Just a proletarian at heart, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Maybe so, but you've got some pretty aristocratic clients, haven't you? Well, that's a bank for you. Yes, you mean the Boulder Guard. Uh, well, oh, here, try some of the sauce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Mmm, my. Oh, they're aristocratic enough as far as the family background is concerned. A social position, that sort of thing. But when it comes to money, that's another story. When you want to know about a man's economic status, <laughs> just ask his bank. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, yeah, so you are. Right? Now, you understand, Mr. Dollar, that I wouldn't ordinarily let this information out. Yes, but yes, I, yes. The yes, fact sure. is, that though the town figures they're rolling in it, the Bowie Guards are broke, near Flatville. They have been for a couple of years. What about that house, the estate? No, my, it's mortgage to the hilt. Like a few other properties, <clears throat> they've still managed to hang on to. But cash... Oh, no, no, they haven't got it. You gonna eat that butter, Mr. Miller? Huh? Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Except the last three or four months. You know, it's a funny thing. Old Jarrett seems to be going around with a pocket full of money. <laughs> Probably borrowing it from his prospective son-in-law. <laughs> Bill Avery, huh? How is he fixed financially? Oh, how is he fixed? A man who can afford a $30,000 engagement gift? <laughs> I've never looked through his account, but I'd say that if he doesn't have it, he soon will have. Oh, my, that boy's a go-getter. Pretty well thought of, huh? Elected him to the board of directors of the bank last month. You're not going to eat that roll? Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I don't know how he finds time for it, that boy. He's got a half a dozen jobs already. He had to postpone his wedding, even. <laughs> they were supposed to get married three weeks ago. Oh, I see. Uh, Lois, the Beauregard maid, wouldn't have anything to do with that, would she? No, oh, gossip, gossip. Oh, what gets around that gossip? Well, she's a pretty little thing, you know. <laughs> and a man who's about to tie himself down for life, well, uh, you know how that is. Huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it'd be just too bad the felon found out about it, though. <laughs> this town would be in with some real excitement if she found... Oh, would you pass that sauce again, Mr. Dollar? <laughs> Come in. 
Afternoon, Chief. I have a couple... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were busy. Well, oh, that's all right. Come on in. Uh, you know Mr. Avery, I believe. Yes, we've met. How are you, Mr. Dolly? Glad you came. This concerns you, too. Well, Mr. Avery figures we're doing this girl Lois an injustice. She's not involved in any of this, Mr. Dollar, either the theft or the murder. She's not the kind. I know her. Oh, well, Mr. Avery. Well enough to know that she's a pretty fine person. The only trouble is, Mr. Avery, I've got a pretty strong case against the girl. She was trying to dispose of the murder gun. She'd know the time, the house would be empty to set up the robbery. She could have given Benny Stark a key to get in. One thing, though, Chief Cotton. We haven't found the necklace. Unless she can be tied up with that, the case won't stand. Uh, we're still looking. What about her room at the Beauregard? Or places around the house that she might have access to? First thing in the morning, we're going to take it to pieces, Mr. Dollar. Uh, you won't find a thing. Wait and see. I'm afraid that's what we'll have to do, Mr. Avery. Wait and see. Well, you go on back and talk to her if you want. I told Ed you could have 15 minutes. Thanks, Chief Cotton. See you, Mr. Dolly. All right. Now, what's on your mind, Mr. Dolly? Jewelers. This is a photo of that necklace. Do you know any jeweler here in town who could make a duplicate imitation? Mm, no. I have to go to Chicago for that. Well, that's what I want to know. Whether somebody did go into Chicago four or five months ago. Well, I could get Jim over here from Hawkley's Jewelry Store. He could give him a technical description over the phone. Chicago police work pretty fast. Might have some information back by this evening. Good. I'll wait to hear from you. There was nothing more I could do until I heard from the Chicago police. So I went to my hotel room to wait it out. Johnny Dollar. Ellen Beauregard, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, Miss Beauregard. We wondered if you'd come out to dinner tonight. Well, that's awfully nice. Uh, yes, I'd like to. Good. Just the family. Seven o'clock, all right? Fine. See you then. <laughs> Expense account item four, $14. Car rental for an additional 24 hours to attend dinner party at home of clients. I arrived at 6.45, parked by the coach house. And then at 7 o'clock, I joined Phil Avery in the billiard room. We were about to start a game when the phone call I'd been hoping for came through. I took it on the extension in the entry hall. Johnny Dollar. The chief cut, Mr. Dollar. Just got word from Chicago. Oh, good. Any luck? Yes. They located the custom jeweler who made a copy of that necklace five months ago. You remembered it well. Did he remember the client? Yes. A girl whose description fits Ellen Beauregard to it, see. Then it all adds up. Oh, I found the necklace, by the way. Well, maybe I'd better come out there. The sooner the better, Chief. I'll see you. Well, good evening, Mr. Beauregard. You've discovered our little family secret, I take it. I'm afraid so. I knew you would. I want to tell you, I warned Ellen, but she's headstrong. Of course, it was legal in the beginning. But not later. No. You'd better ask Ellen to come down. As you wish, Mr. Dollar. Well, shall we start the game, Mr. Avery? Right. Go ahead and break them. Let's make it straight pool, huh? Okay. Good start. Two on the break. Like shooting quail in the brush. <laughs> ah, four ball in the corner pocket. By the way, Mr. Avery, you were right about Lois. She isn't guilty. She was being framed. I told you so. She's not involved in any of this except as an innocent bystander. Even though I found the necklace a little while ago hidden in her room. You found it? Oh, good. The Beauregards, though, are not quite so innocent. Hmm? A seven ball in the side pocket. Mm, what, what do you mean? The Beauregards needed money. They were still keeping up a front, but they were broke. And when you started getting interested in Ellen, they figured you were their answer. 
make her sound pretty cold-blooded. Oh, I don't think there was much love lost on either side. You were playing the same game. Now, wait a minute. It was a natural the way you saw it. Ellen, the last of an old line family, prominent, wealthy. Why, she was the key to open any door in town. So you gambled your stake on a $30,000 gift to show her that you weren't a fortune hunter. Mr. Dollar, I don't like this. Twelve ball in the far corner. Hmm. Then, about a month ago, you had a chance to see the Beauregard accounts at the bank. Why, they were broker than you were. I wasn't marrying Ellen for money. Only trouble was, you couldn't stand losing that 30 grand necklace. So you brought Benny Stark in, and he stole it for you. But when he gave it to you, he told you it was phony. And you thought he was double-crossing you. He got sore and decided to try for a deal with the insurance company. And that's why you killed him. You're accusing me of murder, Mr. Dolly? Let's see now. The uh, eight ball in the end pocket. Well, who else, Mr. Avery? Lois wasn't involved, except that you tried to frame her. The Beauregard knew the sapphire necklace was an imitation. You were the one who didn't. It wasn't an imitation. I paid $30,000 for it. Not this one. Ellen sold yours a month after you gave it to her. They've been living on the money. She had this one made in Chicago. That's dirty look. Another clincher. You were the only one who heard me tell Chief Cotton that we'd have to find the necklace before we could convict Lois. So you brought it here tonight and planted it... Well, apparently I don't have to go on. No, you don't. Did you steal that gun from Uncle Jared, too? Oh, no. This is my own. Better lay down that cue now and get your hands up. Slow and easy. And if I don't, you... Thanks, Miss Parker! Well, a billiard cue makes quite a weapon. What's this all about? Well, it seems your fiancé is the lad who had your safe rifled and then later killed his partner. Okay. Yeah, I guess murder is worse than fraud. What do you mean? You filed an insurance claim on a necklace you'd already sold. I rather imagine the company is going to prosecute it. Chief Cotton's on the way, Miss Beauregard. <laughs> Expense account item five, $114.10. Hotel, incidentals, and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $203.40. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. 